Okay, so some of you know last week, uh, Eileen and I snuck away for this five days in Maui, and uh, which I got off the plane and got sick, you know, and, and so I spent the time in bed. But don't feel bad because we had a beautiful room with a view so we could see the couples romantically strolling out to the bluffs, to, to the restaurant to see the sunset, and we could see the children on their way to play in the pools and the beach and things like that. So we got to, we got to see it all from, from our room. Uh, and uh, anyway, so last uh, Friday we flew home <clears throat> and uh, I, was, I was on the window seat uh, of the exit row. And since she's in a wheelchair, she had to sit in an aisle up front. But um, I was on the leg room. It's poor man's first class. I mean, that's basically what it is. And, uh, and so I was sitting there, and there's a, a wonderful couple came, and they sat next to me, and I greeted them, and they kind of nodded and then sat there. And we're in for a, about a six-hour flight together, you know. So I tried a few niceties, you know, like I would do. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Every once in a while, the guy might respond a little with kind of a smile or a nod, but the wife sitting next to me, nothing. And, uh, and so, uh, and I used my charm, okay, you know, I mean, I, was, I wasn't, you know, aggressive or anything. I just, you know, and every once in a while I'd have to ask, because I'm old, I'd ask them if I could get up and get out to get to the bathroom, and, and, uh, and they never said no. Uh, he'd jump up and make room, and she wouldn't. <laughs> and I'd kind of climb over her and, you know, the whole thing. And, uh, and I thought, this is strange, because usually people are at least friendly, you know. I mean, you don't have to be talkative or gabby, but you can be nice. But, and, they, and they weren't mean. Don't get that. I don't want you to think that. They weren't mean. They were, in case they're watching it on the video right now, uh, they, they uh, just radically indifferent. I think that's more like it. And so, but it was fine, you know, and I, I uh, had my earphones and I could read and stuff, and so I was fine. And then I noticed that she was working on something, and she had a workbook, and she was working, filling in blanks, and studying, and flipping the pages and everything, and I thought, she must be on her way to an important business meeting or something, and so, no wonder she's preoccupied. And so I started, I couldn't really see what it was, and then, you know how you get nosy on a plane? <laughs> you know, okay, I confess it. So, so I kind of get that skulk down thing, look, you know, and it says, how to be an effective witness. <laughs> She's working on a workbook on how to be an effective witness, so I assumed maybe she's an attorney. <laughs> and she's going to help people be more effective in the, you know, as they give a witness in a trial. You know, and you know how some attorneys might be considered, you know, and so I gave her the benefit of the doubt. And then she turned a page and it was all about her church and how you witness for Christ and all these. And I thought to myself, what the heck? <laughs> Six hours next to a guy, and she won't even say, are you on your way to a funeral? Or are you coming back from a wedding? Or are you heading home? Or are you going away from home? No interest, but hours working on how to be a more effective witness for Christ. Sounds like she needed it. <laughs> Sounds like she needed it. Always giving people the benefit. That's good. That's, that's, what, that's the way I taught you. Yeah. And I, I just thought that was so uh, amazing. And I thought, how often do I get that way where I'm so preoccupied with learning the right techniques or the right strategy or getting the right answers or something like that, that I miss the obvious thing of being a witness right where we are with the people that God puts in our path or in the seat next to us, you know? I mean, she could have even said, did you have a nice time in uh, Hawaii? Or who's that lady you get up and uh, help into the bathroom and back with the, you know, nothing. But uh, so then I, I thought of the scripture, <clears throat> which is a, for Mother's Day, and I think it's a, it's a great one, from Isaiah. Uh, chapter 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Get that? 
How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who proclaim good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices and together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns, they will see it with their own eyes, burst into songs of joy together. For the Lord has comforted his people. He's redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. So the Lord teach us from this how we might be your witnesses and we might be people with beautiful feet wherever we go. That's our need today in Jesus' name. Amen. So, how do we be people with beautiful feet? <coughs> I could show you mine. <laughs> They're not that nice. Actually, I have, a, I think it says I have monkey feet. I, I have like <laughs> opposable thumbs on my feet. <laughs> I can peel bananas or something with, or climb trees. <laughs> I, I have this big gap and then my big toe, which is very strange. Right? See, you see that video people? See? And uh, I, I don't know where I got that, but it, it helped me growing up in Africa. So, um, But the thing is, um, how do we be people with, with beautiful feet? How do we be people who bring good news, who bring good tidings, who bring a message of peace, who, who, who bring a message of salvation, so that people rejoice when they see us coming? Is that what God's calling us to be? Or is he calling us to be studious as we work away on our how to be a better witness for Christ and ignore the people next to us? <coughs> ah. So today's Mother's Day. And uh, last year, Eileen lost her mom. A couple years earlier, I lost my mom. And so, you know, think about it. And uh, I want to share with you some of the lessons that my mom uh, taught me, not knowing that she was teaching them. Okay? These are things that... Uh, she did not intentionally teach, but that I picked up from, from watching her and growing up with her. Uh, and she was a very eccentric, uh, unique uh, individual, as you might imagine. <laughs> she had four children, and we were all only children. Uh, we didn't actually belong in the same family. But uh, um, she would do very strange things, and, and um, it seemed like she modeled for me that it didn't matter uh, who people are or where you are or what you're involved in you always practice this kind of radical hospitality and I got that ingrained in me from her and uh, she would do things like and, and I hated it and, and we used to argue about it all the time because we'd show up at a family get-together and there would be some strangers why are you doing this at our family get together? we come you know for Christmas and there'd be some kid from the neighborhood there too and uh, I always thought, this is art time, you know? <laughs> but she didn't ever change her mind. She just kept inviting people and bringing them into the circle. And, uh, and she did that. And, and uh, you know, as a, as a young mom with four little kids uh, and uh, being a new Christian, she said, well, let's go to Africa and, you know, do that. And so they went off the missionaries <laughs> with us, and we all were in the jungle together. And, um, and when you're in the mission field, there, there's certain things that you learn, like, you need to go where people are, because they're not going to come to you. Uh, you need to learn their language uh, so you can understand them and they can understand you. And you need to find ways to, uh, to uh, break into their lives so that they'll feel free to share. And, and I realized that even in the short time that, that we were on the mission field, my mom brought that uh, back, that attitude back. And so uh, a couple of things that she would do. She believed that you need to go where the people are, and you need to hang out with them. And it didn't make sense to me, but when we were young, uh, I think I was in junior high school, uh, she went up and signed us up and we joined the Jewish Community Center of San Diego, uh, the, the center. And we were there, I'd swim in the pool every day, did all the activities, took a cooking class, uh, got sued because I threw salt in somebody's face and you know, all that. But um, that was our friend. I went to every bar mitzvah in San Diego for like years uh, and uh, kept wondering when my turn would come, you know. And I never got bar mitzvah. But, but uh, she said, these are our neighbors. These are our friends. We're going to hang out with them. And, and we did. 
And uh, people at the church thought, why? Why are you doing that? And my mom never said. It was just, they're here, we're here, let's hang out. And so uh, every Saturday we went to Blummer's uh, Kosher Deli and we got our pastrami and our rye bread and our dill pickles and our herring. And uh, we hung out with all the people that we hung out with at the center. And, and that, that was our life. And I think that it was uh, the, the point of if you're going to be someone who brings good news, then you might as well hang out with people where they are and be a joyful presence and be an encourager. Uh, where, where, right where you are. And, uh, and then she, she uh, decided that she wanted to help people who were lost and uh, stressed out and confused and disoriented. So she decided, where are people lost and disoriented and stressed out? The San Diego Lindbergh Airport. <laughs> so she went and volunteered every day at the Traveler's Aid booth. <laughs> And every day she'd go there and people would come by and they'd look lost and confused and she'd try and help them out and figure things out and take them where they need to go and stuff like that as a volunteer. And I always thought, that's stupid. What a waste of time. You could be playing bridge at the uh, Konokai Club. <laughs> but no, she was hanging out at the airport every day, just helping travelers get to where they need to go and find out what they need to know. And, uh, and then later in her life, Third lesson, she was concerned about justice, and justice was important to her in the community, and, and you know, what's an old lady gonna do uh, about justice? What, what are you gonna do? You know, she was retired years, you know, and um, didn't know what to do. So we came and visited her, and I asked her what she was involved in. She was, every day, a juror downtown San Diego. The courts loved her because she was objective and she didn't come in with a predetermined idea so the defense liked her, the prosecutors liked her, and she never got manipulated by people who were trying to you know persuade or control things. She was she was uh, belligerently independent uh, I'd say. <laughs> I have that gift too. And uh, But she, everybody wanted her on the jury so she would work in the jury five days a week and she got a free lunch. <laughs> It was like, how good is this? You know, I got lunch and I get to be there. And then she's deciding murder cases and different, all these different things. And, uh, and she just did that on into her years uh, and, um, and loved it. And, um, and I thought, she never stopped being the missionary that she was as a young mom in Africa. She just did it where she was. Go where people are, learn their culture, be a part of it, go where there needs to be justice, lend a hand, help people who are lost or stressed or confused, help them out tangibly. And then uh, at the end of her life, uh, we were sitting there in the living room and um, I was grousing about ministry, you know, as I often do, and uh, you know, I, 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 who's there? nobody's following me, and, I, 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 and how can I be a leader if they're not following me? This guy, and she goes, John, John, no, 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 who's the shepherd? Yeah, I know, I know. No, no. Remember who the shepherd is. I know, I know, Mom. I know. No, no. Remember who the shepherd is. And then she died that night. One of the last things she said to me. And I thought, you know, she pursued justice, she pursued people, she pursued uh, people in a, in a caring way, in an including way, in a radically hospitable way, and she never forgot who the shepherd was. And I thought, you know, that is a little bit of what I think of when I see this, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings and proclaim salvation, who say, your God reigns. And I think most of my life, when I think of being a witness for Christ, you know, I would think about what I need to do to be a better witness. How do I do witnessing? How do I share? What, what 
questions are people going to ask me that I need to have answers all prepared for so I can just fire them back, you know, with confidence. And even if they don't ask the question, I might say, you might want to ask this, and then, bow, just blast them with the answer. Even they're going, well, I wasn't going to ask that, you know. But, uh, you know, and, and I was always, how do you do it? How do you do it? And, and there's seminars all over the country on how to be a witness, what to do in these situations and that situations, and, and what do you say to people, and how do you approach people, and all these things. Strategies for being a witness for Christ. So I look in the New Testament in the Bible, and, and the word witness is used about 42 times, I counted. It is never used as something that you do. Ever. Isn't that weird? I misunderstood that. It's always used in the context of something. You be a witness. You don't do it. You be a witness. A witness is somebody who lays down their life, who just opens up their life for the sake of, of the kingdom, for the sake of Christ, and, and uh, to bring hope and good news and self salvation, all these things. And, and you just open up your life and you, and you are a witness. You don't do witnessing. I think that's why, uh, you know, sharing our faith has gotten to be such a bad thing around here because everybody goes, oh boy, oh, we're not gonna do that because we've had bad experiences of people who come at us and they don't listen and they don't care, they don't know us and they don't have a right to speak into our life and they're trying to pound answers into questions we don't have, like I did for so many years. and. Uh, and I think people are longing to have folks around them be witnesses to God's love, to God's mercy, to grace, to justice, uh, to include, welcome them in, help them be part of the family, all of these things. Uh, if we could be that. So, how do we be witnesses? Um, uh, anybody ever crossed the border? Yeah. I've crossed a lot of borders, man. I think I've been to almost every country in the world. Not everyone, not Australia, but almost all of them. And uh, the border crossings always make me nervous. And I don't know why that is. Even going up into uh, uh, La Canada, <laughs> La Canada, uh, even going up there is an authority thing. I remember, uh, you know, and they always ask the same questions. And I thought about it. I thought, you know, these questions are probably what we could be thinking about as we are witnesses with the people around us. And the first one is, who are you? you know, do you have any identification? You know, who are you? We need to ask people that. If that lady next to me on the plane wanted to be a witness instead of do witnessing, she might have turned to me and said, who are you? What's your story? Would have changed everything. Would have opened the door for some conversations. She might have even been able to help me with a lot of my problems. Who knows? Um, I remember... Uh, when we were first dating, I was 17, she was 21, Eileen was 21, and uh, which, you know, four years makes a difference when you're 17. Just saying. <laughs> I, you know, it's like I was getting out of high school, she was getting out of college, you know, that kind of thing, you know. And I told her I could date women up to age 23, you know. She said, go try. And so, but one of the first, I found out, I was so shocked, you know, because she came with an Irish family, and, and she said that she'd never had Mexican food. This is in San Diego. <laughs> San Diego, the name, San Diego. You know, you're already speaking Spanish. And uh, she'd never had Mexican food, and so I decided, guy like me, gonna show her the way to do this. Got her in my little Volkswagen, 1960 Volkswagen bug with holes in the floorboard and body putty all over. And drove down to the Mexican border. Gonna take her to Rosarita Beach, to the hotel in Rosarita Beach, down by Ensenada, and I'm just gonna have her have lunch 
real authentic Mexican restaurant. I mean, cats running through and the cook following them, you know, the whole deal, you know. And, uh, real, here are your tacos. <laughs> so, you know, but, um, so we get to the border and there's this border guard and he leans in the window. Says, do you have identification? He's talking to her, young lady. You better have some identification. So she shows her ID. She's 21. Then he looks at me. You, I show mine. I'm 17. I'm not allowed to cross the border. <laughs> I'm underage to cross the border. He looks at it, looks at me, looks at it, looks at me. Good luck, Senior Westfall. <laughs> <laughs> but he wanted to know who I was, you know. I'm the guy with the older lady. <laughs> Good luck. And uh, anyway, so we, uh, but, but that's really important. And I think if we can share who we are, who are we in our essence? Not necessarily just what we do, or something, but where have we been in our life? And ask people that. What's your story? Where have you been? And as people open up, it opens the door for relationships to form and, and care and love and interest because suddenly we're starting to know each other. And we're people with beautiful feet then. And then they ask, where have you been? They never ask where you're going at the border. They always ask, where have you been? And because uh, I guess that matters to them. And I remember once, a few years ago, we were driving up the uh, Canadian border, and Eileen has a thing about authority, probably, and, um, and the officer at the border looks at her and says, where have you been? And she goes, we've been shopping in California. <laughs> we haven't. <laughs> we have not. We were living in Edmonds, and we were just on our way up to visit. And she froze. <laughs> You've been shopping in California? Uh, uh, and as we drove off, I said, why would you say that? I don't know. <laughs> it's just all that came out when, it, when he said that. Where, it's all I could think of, you know. But, but, you know, be able to share where have you been and ask people, hey, where have you been in your life? Where have you been? Have you been through hard stuff? Have you been through difficult stuff? Have you been wading through the swamp? Have you been on top of the mountain? Have you been celebrating? Have you been coasting? Where have you been? And then that becomes our witness, right? And just in, in asking the question. And then the third one is that they always say, do you have anything to declare? And I'm not wanting to say fresh fruit, you know, because that's contraband. And, uh, and, uh, and it's a chance for us to say, yes, I do have something to declare. You know, I've, I've found that in the middle of all this stuff that I've gone through, that uh, I met the Lord in this. And uh, it's made a difference. And uh, still have issues, but here's how God's meeting me in that. And, and we have something to declare. And we become men and women with beautiful feet. I'm not going to ask you now to take your shoes off and show us, you know. I could, but we're being on, you know, YouTube doesn't want to see that. They don't want to see your feet. But what would it be for us to be the people that people celebrate when they see you coming? Because they know you're bringing good news. They know that you're bringing uh, a blessing, and you care, and you're in their life, and you care about justice, and you, and you care about the community. You know, I hope that on Saturday when we do the garden and we team up with uh, other people in the community and, and share and things like that, that, that we be people with beautiful feet and that we not be there, uh, you know, lecturing them on uh, how to plant uh, asparagus, you know. I just picked that. I don't know if we're planting asparagus. But, um, what we do in the garden doesn't matter nearly as much as what happens as we share together. And let's be the people with the beautiful feet. 
and and uh, when we when we work with the families in the preschool, which some are Christians, some aren't, some are pagans. Uh, it's a great mix of kids. And if you saw Facebook this week, you saw my little story. I, I went in Friday to volunteer because that's a way I can get to know some of the kids and their families and meet the moms and dads when they come. And I told you about this one kid who was a terror nightmare and I kept calling him my friend. So this week, he, what does he do? He, his mom takes him, his mom tells me, she's waiting for me when I show up Friday morning. And uh, not that I was late, <laughs> but um, she was waiting and she said, you know, I took our son uh, to the doctor and the doctor um, was checking him out and asked him, you know, do, do you have a best friend? And he said, oh yes, his name is Pastor John. <laughs> Wow. You know? And I thought, I don't know if I, when I was that age if I would have said that the pastor was my best friend. I don't think he ever spoke to me, you know? But um, for, the, for this kid, we, I've got a friend for life. And, um, and I think that's some of what can happen. And, and we become the people, that, they don't dread us coming. They don't dread what we're going to share, what we're going to drag out of them, or what we're going to hit them with. We're, we're just going to be a witness. And we won't even know we're doing it because we're being it. And I think that's uh, what God wants for us. That's what my mom showed me, and that's what I am sharing with you. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your care, and we thank you that you do call us to be your witnesses. And you tell us when the Spirit comes upon us, we will be your witnesses here, there, and everywhere. And so give us the courage to, to come alongside, to be with folks who are different than us, who may look at the world differently, who may believe different things, and, and give us the courage to hang out authentically and, and just love them and care for them and be involved in life together. And uh, show us how we might have beautiful feet, bringing good news. That's our, that's our hope. That's our dream today in Jesus' name. Amen.